Hey everybody, it's Chuck Dixon back to answer your questions. And what are all your questions about? Yeah, you know what I do for a living and what I do for a living is I write comic books. So let's get uh, to business. If you have a question for Ask Chuck Dixon, that would be me. Uh, you can send it to brunobookstore at gmail.com. It's the most um, direct way to reach me. I check it a few times a day. I'm not going to miss it, I, I, and I love reading your questions, your suggestions, your comments. People send me images of stuff. It's, it's a lot of fun and very much appreciated, and sometimes I'll even answer questions through the email that I'm not about to answer <laughs> over uh, the Internet. Okay, let's get to the first question from Jared Mitchell. There's a notion that superheroes are super gods, and they represent modern versions of classical mythology. Uh, what are your thoughts? Um, yeah, I mean, I hear this. I get questioned about this a lot. Uh, I think it makes comics a little more grandiose than they are uh, to think that they contribute to culture in a way that the ancient myths contributed to the culture of their day. And let's face it, these are created uh, as wish fulfillment fantasies for escapist fiction purposes. Uh, they're not like ancient mythology uh, used to explain the inexplicable. You know, back in the day, you know, how does the sun travel across the sky? Well, a, a guy draws it in a chariot. You know, what, what, what causes the sound of thunder? It's this big guy with a hammer. You know, um, you know we're, how does the earth w remain in place? It, it, sit, it rests on the back of a giant turtle. You know, things like this. I mean, people were explaining because they didn't have the science, they didn't have the technology, they didn't have the knowledge. They were trying to explain the world around them, which, you know, made them feel more comfortable. Because you don't want to live in a world of mystery where you don't know why anything's happening. And so you had people who just make up answers. <laughs> and, and, you know, this made people feel better. I don't think comic books are made to make people particularly feel better other than, you know, entertaining them and i've never been attracted to the godlike characters to begin with i i like the more street level uh type character i my heroes are generally not out to save the universe they're out to pay their bills and so the whole idea of super gods and comics as a as a new mythology it just doesn't sit well with me so yeah, I'm not. I'm, I don't subscribe to that theory. But if you like that theory and you want to write in that theory, God bless you. You know, do that. If that's your approach to the material, I got no problem with that. It's just not mine. Sean Jump, I have a question regarding your great. Well, thank you, Doctor Doom miniseries known as Doom: The Emperor Returns. How did you prepare to deal with a villainous character like Victor Von Doom, usually rated as the arch villain of Marvel Comics? A position I wholeheartedly agree with. Me too, Sean. Uh, did your attitude toward the character change any as you wrote the story? Do you feel that Doom is essentially evil incarnate, as portrayed by Mark Wade in Unspeakable, or that he is a somewhat tragic character whose ambition, arrogance, and hatred of researchers has have twisted a potentially noble character beyond redemption, which is how he comes across to me in Jim Shooter's origin, original Secret Wars? Um, I'm just, a, I'm a Doom fanatic. Doom is my favorite comic book villain of all time. I loved him when I was a kid. My first Fantastic Four comic was issue number five, beginning of Doctor Doom, the first appearance of Doctor Doom. Loved the character. Uh, you know, and then a few years later, they did his origin. I just, and I, I agree with the Jim Shooter approach. Uh, you know, that he's a tragic character. He, he believes he's doing right, um, but he's, he, he's petty and vindictive. You know, that's what's great about him. He's this grandiose, frightening character. You know, he's just so full of himself, and he's so confident, sure of what he's doing, and so arrogant. But then at the heart of it, you know, he just holds this grudge against Reed Richards because he's, I think in his heart, he fears that he may be the most, he may be the second most intelligent human being in the in the Marvel Universe that, that Reed may be a little bit smarter than him and he his hubris just can't handle this 
Uh, but he is a tragic character coming from a past, you know, his, with his mother and all that stuff. And, and um, yeah, I don't see him as evil incarnate. I don't like evil incarnate characters. I feel that every villain in a story is doing what they're doing, you know, unless they're an utter psychopath. And even then they've deluded themselves. Um, but but I, I think villains are, they have the belief they're doing the right thing. Even when they've gone too far, it's, it's the, 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 um, the ends justify the means for these guys. Uh, and, and in the case of Dr. Doom, he's, you know, looking out for his little country of Latveria by trying to dominate the world, <laughs> you know, uh, and, and, you know, that's his main mission in life is to bring order out of chaos. Uh, so, you know, how did I prepare for the miniseries? I, I just wrote Doom the way that I felt in my heart that he was ever since I was a kid. I just wrote the Dr. Doom that I knew. Uh, so there wasn't a lot of preparation or thought because I'd always wanted to write Dr. Doom stories. Uh, so I was kind of geared up and, and hit the ground running immediately. Um, so it wasn't, uh, it wasn't that tough a deal for me to, uh, to work on the, the doom thing. Yeah. The only thing that threw me was it's sort of set in a different reality at different continuities. He wasn't on planet earth. There was sort of like a apocalyptic road warrior aspect to it, which made it interesting. But, you know, you know, at the end of the day, you know, doom is doom. It, it's, it, it, you could plop Doom down in any continuity, in any kind of story, in any kind of environment, and he's going to triumph and uh, and and dominate and oppress. <laughs> he's going to be the top dog. It's it's kind of like the same approach I have to uh, Bane. Uh, Bane has a lot of Doom aspects to him. You know, the pettiness and and the ruthlessness and the, the total arrogance about everything he does. That he he must be the best. For him to succeed, all others must fail. And uh, that's certainly Doom's philosophy. So, yeah, it was a blast to write. I, I would, you know, uh, I, and I was very grateful for the opportunity and the trust they put into me to basically bring Doom back into the Marvel Universe. Okay, John Castle Ananya. I hope I'm getting that right. What is the continuity of your Batman spawn one shot? Uh, yeah, I really have no idea. <laughs> I, I don't know where, I guess it fits in Batman canon because myself and the other writers, we didn't like writing things that were outside of canon unless it was an Elseworlds story. So, um, I assume it fits somewhere in Batman continuity. I don't know where it fits in Spawn continuity. Um, in fact, when we, before we started work on the book, uh, Denny O'Neill assigned, um, Myself, uh, Doug Manchin, and Alan Grant to write this. Uh, we were at a bat summit. I've told the story before, but it's worth telling again. Uh, Denny didn't want to assign it to just one of the regular bat writers because he knew it was going to be an enormous royalty payday, and it was. It, it was. It still pays out to this day. Very, very popular project. So, Denny thought it was unfair to just favor one writer over the other two. So he said that the three of us would write it. And how would we write it? Um, we decided that we would put our names on a slips of paper and uh, they would be drawn out of Denny's hat. Denny always wore this ass-kicking hat. And um, Jordan Gorfinkel drew the names. And so Doug Mench's name was drawn first, so he would, he would write the beginning of the story. Mine was drawn second. I would write the middle of the story. And Alan Grant's name was drawn last. And he would write the end of the story. But how to plot it? We didn't know anything about Spawn. And we bought some of the comics and read them. And still didn't know anything about Spawn. We really didn't understand the character at all. So Doug Mensch, uh, I think the second evening of the summit, um, called Tom McFarlane on the phone. And he sat there with a legal pad. And, and asked Todd about all the things we needed to know about Spawn. He wrote them all down. And then the next day he explained Spawn to us as, as Todd McFarlane had described it to him so that we had some grasp of the character. And, uh, you know, but, you know, and from there we just sort of came up with a, 
you know, a MacGuffin for the plot line, War Devil and all that stuff, and uh, and just went to work and just, you know, Doug wrote his 15 pages. I wrote the next 15 pages, and then Alan did cleanup, you know, based on the very, very loose plot that uh, we had cooked up. And I think the plot was mostly cooked up by Doug and Alan. They were they were closer collaborators than I than I ever was with them, so I think they they cooked that up overnight, and uh, presented it to the rest of us on the last day of the summit, and then and then and then we went to town. Uh, as I said before, my only uh, requests on the story was that Batman be allowed to make fun of Spawn's cape, and that. Uh, Spawn introduced himself by saying, you can call me Al. And Todd McFarlane was fine with both of those things. So I was pleased. Because I, I, <laughs> I thought they were, you know, pretty good gags. Uh, but yeah, as far as continuity, where it fits in, is anybody's guess. Tommy Morris. Howdy, Chuck. I think you and Jorge Zafino are one of comics' dream teams and ended way too soon. I've recently revisited Winter World, The Horned God, that was an issue of Savage Sword of Conan, and Seven Block, all masterpieces from both of you. Could you fill us in a little about this fallen enigmatic, enigmatic master and why you are not working with Gerardo? Gerardo is uh, Jorge Zafino's son. Um, well, I'm, I'll start with Gerardo. I mean, I've, I've been in contact with Gerardo uh, because he's the heir to you know, Jorge's estate. Uh, and so is, um, you know, basically my partner in the ownership of the different various creator-owned properties that, that Jorge and I put together, uh, Seven Block and, and Winter World. And um, so I've been in contact with him, and his artwork is amazing. I mean, he, he draws very much like his dad, uh, but he's got his own iconic, um, like, you know, idiosyncratic, idiosyncratic, stamp on the work uh you know so he's his own guy but you know it's, it's hard to get away you know, let me look at the cuberts uh adam and andy i mean they draw a little like their dad and, and in the past a lot like their dad because why wouldn't they you know he, he so jorge is obviously gerardo's main influence and uh he's 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 done well i, I haven't worked with him because there's simply no project has come up uh, to work i certainly would love to work with him someday now, as far as, um, you know, my relationship with Jorge, uh, you know, I saw his artwork in a portfolio shown to me by the Villagran brothers. And they showed me all of these different, you know, uh, pieces of artwork by, you know, a variety of Argentine artists that they knew and worked with and were friends with. And... Um, the work was all uniformly excellent, but the most striking of all the stuff they showed me was was Jorge's work. There was just this raw power to it, just this assured authority, and and the way he could work in such an impressionistic way but still have a huge impact. I mean, I, I had to work with the guy, and I wanted to create something as raw as uh, his work was, and so I, I came up with Winter World. And uh, Eclipse greenlit it, I think mostly based on Jorge's artwork. Uh, Jorge did a couple of promo pieces uh, that basically served as the three covers for the series. And, you know, you know we went to work. And it, it was quite successful, particularly amongst other artists in the industry. Jorge was very much an artist. artist. Uh, when I meet an artist for the first time, generally they always ask about Jorge Zafino. What was he like and everything else? And what was he like? Jorge was just the sweetheart of a guy. Just a terrific guy. Um, super professional, super dedicated, very self-effacing. I mean, I, I believe he was a comic book genius, but you know, he didn't act like one. There, there wasn't an ounce of prima donna in this guy. He was always concerned that I would like the work. I remember he he gifted me a a drawing of Batman when I when I showed up in Buenos Aires when I went down there for a visit he, and I said wow this is terrific well terrific is not a word that the Spanish people understand and he looked crestfallen when I said this is terrific 
because he thought it meant terrible. And then uh, uh, Enrique Villagran had to quickly say, no, 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 he, he means it's good. <laughs> he means he loves it. And, and his face brightened up. But um, so I got to spend some time with him when I was in Buenos Aires. And I got to spend time with him when he visited New York once. And the thing is, I didn't speak Spanish. I still don't speak Spanish. He, he didn't speak English. And um, at one point I was visiting his apartment in Buenos Aires. And uh, his wife had made dinner, and it was you know it was a, it was a terrific evening, and we had a translator there with us so that we could talk to each other, and the translator had to excuse himself to use the bathroom, and Jorge and I are left alone to just sort of stare at one another, and so I said uh, Russ Heath, and he goes oh Russ Heath see see see, and then he starts naming Argentine artists, and I would go oh yeah yeah that guy's great you know so we just basically. Uh, we're idolizing our favorite artists back and forth because it was the language of comics, the shared interest and shared language of comics. We, we, didn't, we didn't need to uh, know each other's spoken language to communicate that way, to, to basically to geek out. <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, he, he, um, he, he, he left us way too soon. He was, uh, I think he was 42. When uh, he died of a massive heart attack, and it's an enormous loss, uh, because I, he, I think he was really just getting started in international comics, working for Europe and working for the United States. Uh, he, he, as amazing as his work was, I, I don't think he was anywhere near the uh, the peak of his powers. So it, it's a very sad. But just, a, a, you know, I, you know, I, I lost a collaborator, I lost a friend, and, and comics lost. Um, a tremendous contributor to the medium whose influence is still felt today. You see a lot of artists who have little Jorge touches to their work and uh, he's still you know, greatly admired throughout the industry for, for his work. So uh, there you have it. There's the, there's the book on uh, my friend Jorjito. Phil Hatfield, what is your all-time favorite TV Western? Well, hands down, The Rifleman. It's actually my favorite television show of all time. Uh, Lucas McCain and his young son, what's-his-face, Mark. <laughs> I haven't watched an episode in a while. Uh, but, uh, yeah, this is my favorite. I loved it as a kid. It was my dad's favorite Western. This is back when they had half-hour drama shows. and They were just packed with story from beginning to end. And every episode of The Rifleman is essentially the same. Somebody shows up in Norfolk, the town near uh, near uh, Lucas McCain's ranch, and starts pushing people around and, and pissing Lucas off. Uh, but he's a man of peace. He doesn't want any trouble, even though he carries a <laughs> lever-action Winchester around with him. You know, he, he, you know, he'd rather you know get along than, than have to kill everybody. But it, by the end of the episode, he's... He's got to kill everybody. He's all the bad guys have got to go. Uh, the what makes the show special is is the interesting ways they would get to that final confrontation, and the twists and turns because they knew you know we can't just have the same story every week. So they would you know find different ways to add emotional heart to the story and consequences and stakes and everything else. But you know, but you tuned in to see Lucas just gun these guys down, and. Uh, <laughs> And look cool doing it. So, but yeah, still my favorite show. It's just a show with a lot of heart. I have a lot of affection for it. Okay, Thomas Arbonitis. How do you find a new artist for new projects? Is there some old artists you work with in the past you hit up much nowadays? Curious if you've done anything with Joe Bennett also. Uh, no, I've never, I've never worked with Joe Bennett. Um, you know, I'm certainly aware of his art. I'm certainly aware he's a very talented guy. You know, unless maybe I worked with him back when, you know, he was a young Turk just getting into the business and, you know, they, they handed me a story and I'd forgotten about it by now. But I, I don't believe I ever I ever worked with him. I broke a lot of guys in. I, I'm, I was the first writer for an awful lot of guys in the 80s and 90s who were just getting in. Uh, but, you know, how do you find artists? Well, you can go to Artist Alley, but most of Artist Alley is people shilling prints and stuff like that. So you're not going to find a lot of exciting new talent there. 
Uh, mostly I have, well, Neil Adams, yeah. But, but <laughs> I'm not saying anything about Neil here. You know, Neil's, you know, turning his work into coin. We've all done it. We've all sat in Artist Alley and uh, sold stuff. So, you know, that's fine. But, you know, you're not going to find, you know, generally you're not going to find anybody that does real continuity work uh, in Artist Alley. So it's, it's kind of a waste to go there. But, you know, interesting to see people. And a lot of times it's old friends, you know. you know, And a lot of times it's me. I'm, I'm there hawking my work, generally seated uh, at a table next to Sergio Cariello. And a good time is had by all. But um, I, I find a lot of artists over the web, you know, people approach me all the time. They always want to show me samples uh, by email or through private messaging on Facebook. And I've actually found a number of guys to work with in that way. Uh, you know, a lot of times a guy will approach me and say, you know, a guy or gal will approach me and say, look, I, I've got, you know, would you take a look at my portfolio? And they've got websites and I'll go take a look. And I've always got projects in mind that if I found the right artist, I would do them. Uh, I'm just sort of like waiting for the right person. And uh, recently I've started a new project for ArcTunes with Anthony Gonzalez uh, Clark. Uh, it's a new project called My Sister Suprema. And uh, it's a project I've had in mind for years. But I saw his artwork and it's like, wow, this guy fits so perfectly. And he was anxious to work with me. So uh, we went to town and that, that, um, that series should be premiering soon on ArcTunes, My Sister Suprema. It's a superhero parody. And uh, Anthony's work is just, it, it, it's a comedy. And uh, he, he just brings so much to the party. It's so much funnier with his artwork. Um, it's a terrific collaboration. As far as working with guys I've worked with before, yeah, I've, I've always got my short list. Uh, <clears throat> often I can't afford to work with them. Their page rates are too high. But uh, I'm always anxious, you know, to work with uh, Graham Nolan or Sergio. Or, and, you know, right now I'm, I'm working on a project for Graham Nolan it's a uh, anthology of action adventure stories. And I just uh, earlier this week scripted a 10 page story about Vikings that Kike Alcatena will be doing. And uh, Kike is a longtime collaborator. We worked on Punisher, Alien Legion, Conan, Batman together. Uh, and uh, I was anxious, you know, to work with him again. And when Graham brought this project up, you know, he said he had a bunch of artists in mind. And I said, well, for this story, I'd really like to work with Kike. And of course, Graham was all for it. And he's very familiar with uh, Alcatena's work, which is always amazing. So I, I believe Alcatena at this moment, I, I wrote the script on a Monday. Uh, today, as I'm recording this, is a Friday. And I think Kike's already at work on it. So, um, so yeah, I mean, it's a mix of the old and the new. Uh, you know, I'll work with the older pros that, I, that I've worked with before because they're friends uh, every chance I get. But I'm always looking for new talent, uh, always willing to look at someone's portfolio to see if uh, we're a good fit together. In the early 90s, I, I don't know who wrote this question. Somehow I lost their name and I apologize. If you, if you email me at brunobookstore.com, I'll make it up to you somehow. Uh, but sorry, today you don't get your name mentioned on the Internet. Uh, anyway, it's a great question. In the early 90s, all of the Superman titles essentially became one book with one title leading directly into the next. The Bat books, on the other hand, were kept somewhat separate unless a crossover was involved. Was there ever any talk to do to the Bat books what had been done to the Superman books? Yes, there was. Um, basically, shortly after the Superman books began the policy of having stories lead from one comic to another... Uh, Denny O'Neill brought up at a Bat Summit, the 1994 Bat Summit, which this is a picture of. Uh, he brought, well, let, before we go ahead, let me, let me identify everybody in the picture. Okay, front row, left to right, that's Doug Mensch, Alan Grant, Graham Nolan, Denny O'Neill, and Archie Goodwin there at the end. Uh, back row, left to right, that's Jim Ballant, uh, then me. Then Jordan Gorfinkel, Scott Peterson, and Darren Vincenzo. So, so now you know everybody. 
This is the day that we picked the new Batman costume that would be used coming out of Nightfall. Uh, anyway, back to my story. Uh, Denny proposed that we <clears throat> take the three Batman monthlies and do the same thing the Superman people had done. And we run the stories concurrently through them. And uh, not only that, but unlike the Superman titles, which would be continued to be written by their usual writers, Roger Stern, um, Dan Jurgens, Jerry, Orba, Jerry uh, Ordway, um, our, our monthly arcs would all be written by the same writer. So in other words, uh, one month, Doug would write all three issues. Uh, Batman, Detective, and Shadow of the Bat. The next month, Alan would write all three monthlies, and then I would write all three monthlies following that. We would just do round robin when we go back and forth. Um, I don't think Doug or Alan were happy with this idea, but they didn't. Either they didn't say anything, or I was the first one to speak up. And I said, I I can't tell you how much I hate this idea, uh, for a variety of reasons. I said, number one, I'm, I'm finally getting to work with Graham Nolan, and we're really in a stride here on, on Detective. We're really hitting a great rhythm here on the stories and everything else, and I don't want to do anything to break that up. You know, and I said, the, the other reason is, is that all three of these titles have a distinct flavor to them. Uh, Doug, was writing, <clears throat> Doug was writing these, you know, creepier, quasi-supernatural stories i was dealing with police procedural mysteries you know in keeping with the detective comics theme and alan was writing what alan writes these these you know complicated uh character profiles of you know psychotics <laughs> you know, he was coming up with these great new villains and uh he was you know he had his own we all had our own Universes. He, he was writing Batman in the Allen verse. I was writing Batman in the Dixon verse, and Doug was writing Doug in, in the in the Mensch verse. And I think we were all happy the way we were, and we didn't want to go to this new format. The other argument I made was, is that the art style on all three books was so diverse that it would be jarring to the readers. Okay, the artists we 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 all had great art teams. But their art didn't look similar. I mean, you know, Batman didn't even look the same in each one of these books. There was no consistency. And I thought particularly jarring to jump from Kelly Jones to Graham Nolan or Graham Nolan back to Kelly Jones. Uh, you know, it just, while they are, you know, tremendous Batman talents, legendary comic book, Batman comic book artists, their styles don't match. They're nothing like one another. Their approaches aren't anything like one another. And I thought that ultimately it would fail. I thought it would the 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 we would see a fall in sales. And Denny's reply, well, Denny was shocked. And, and but his first reply was, Well, do you know that by not writing, you know, you're having an opportunity to write Batman. You're having an opportunity to write the lead title. And Batman pays much higher royalties than either Detective Comics or Shadow of the Bat. So your income would go up by writing, a, you know, Batman, you know, four times a year. And I said, I don't, I don't care about that. I don't, that doesn't matter to me. It more matters to me that Graham and I stay what we're doing. And I said, and I know, you know, even though they're not saying anything, I, I know Doug just keep, wants to keep working with Kelly. He loves working with Kelly. And I know that Alan just wants to keep doing his own thing, you know. Um, and so <laughs> Denny said, well, but I've already told Jeanette, or Paul, it was Paul Levitz at the time, I've already told Paul that this is what we're doing. You know, this is the main thrust of the Bat Summit, that we're going to plan, this Bat Summit, we're going to plan out this new scheme. And... Uh, I said, well, like I said, you know, look, I, you know, if that's what we're going to do, that's what we're going to do. But I'm not happy, and I don't think anybody else is. I don't think any of our other creative team are happy. And so then he gets on the phone and he goes into another room. We had like a suite we were meeting in. He goes into another room. Well, we can hear him, <laughs> and he says, 
he said he calls Paul and he says, Look, we got a change in plans. We're gonna have to change what we're doing. He says, uh, I, I I, I didn't think this would ever happen, but we have a, a writer who's refusing higher royalties. <laughs> he says, Chuck doesn't want to do it. And uh, so we didn't. Uh, you know, I made my arguments, and apparently uh, Denny and Paul were convinced by them. And I think Doug and Alan both heaved a sigh of relief that we wouldn't have to be, we wouldn't have to go this route. And, uh, you know, we were good. So that's why. You know, you can blame me. That's why the Bat titles didn't follow what the Superman titles were doing and doing continuous stories across the three monthlies. And the thing is, it fit for Superman because the, the Superman art was, you know, consistent. You know, the styles of all the people doing Superman, it wasn't jarring to jump from... I mean, I've read some of these continuities recently. And, and there's no, like, you know, oh, my God, everything's changed. Superman doesn't look the same as he did in the previous installment. Uh, you know, so, it, you know, it worked for Superman. It was never going to work for Batman. So here we go. Here we go. This is the question I've been getting over and over and over and over again. And I want to be fair because a lot of you have asked this question. And uh, you know, I think I've had everything but people coming to my door to ask this question. I've got it on Facebook, emails, private messaging. And uh, I guess everybody wants an answer, so I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna be fair and put up the first questions I got on this from Facebook. Uh, John Trent says, "What's your reaction to DC Comics retconning Tim Drake and making him attracted to dudes?" Uh, Jonathan Haley Tang shortly thereafter said, "What are your thoughts on the recent Tim Drake retcon?" Stefan the Wiki, very disgusting, the term Tim, where he was never, when he never was written as gay. Tom Morris, do you have any thoughts on the apparent trend of legendary creators now disowning, being ashamed of the work or works they, that made them legends? Also, sorry that the new memo from DC must be, yeah, do we have anything else Chuck Dixon worked on that we can bleep all over? Um... Okay, my bonafides. What are my bonafides on Robin? I wrote a hundred of his monthly issues. I wrote numerous miniseries, specials, annuals uh, of Tim Drake Robin. I did not create Tim Drake Robin. Marv Wolfman created Tim Drake Robin. Alan Grant further developed Tim Drake. But then I was tasked, tasked by Denny O'Neill to develop the character further and make him worthy of of being Batman's sidekick, basically. So he moved from ancillary character to full-fledged boy wonder. Um, and, you know, Robin is an iconic character, been around forever. And, uh, you know, it's, you know, most of what I feel, I you know, I'm not surprised by what happened because... <laughs> this is what they do. Uh, and it's just kind of, you know, um, it's it's disappointing more than anything else. Because why, why couldn't they just create a new character uh, instead of leaning into a question that's existed for the Robin character almost since his creation, thanks to uh, this gentleman, Frederick Wortham, who introduced the idea that uh, there may be some sort of homosexual subtext to Batman and Robin, and now they've basically confirmed it. Uh, for what reason, I have no understanding. I mean, it's a cynical marketing ploy because it brings attention to the title, what it will not bring to the title is increased sales. Uh, because these things never work that way. It, there have been gay characters in American comics since the 80s. It's not a new thing. It's not stunning or brave. It's just changing things for the sake of changing them. 
uh, I mean, what's next? You know, uh, Hal Jordan is a cannibal. <laughs> I mean, what 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 are they going to do next? Uh, but this is this is the this has been the flavor of the month for almost three decades, is to reveal that a character is is bi or gay, which to me is a distinction without a difference. But um, so I don't understand the point of it. The character was never written this way, never conceived this way. But this is going to be his continuity from now on. Even if they retcon it back, even if they do a reboot and, and he's no longer by curious um, he will be by curious for the rest of time uh, you know th this is going to be part of his continuity and I don't think there's any real good reason for this beyond a simple marketing ploy and um, like I said these marketing ploys aren't even uh, you know they don't work. They're not effective. They don't raise sales, but they raise interest from the media and from the peers within the industry, which I guess is the point, um, you know, to get uh, your back slapped at, a, at an editorial meeting or possibly, you know, get an interview with Vanity Fair. Uh, you know, maybe your maybe your name might get mentioned on CNN. Uh, you know, that's that's the end result of this. But I think the vast majority of the American public has no idea who Tim Drake is. So now Robin is gay because they, they don't they don't know the difference between they don't know there's been three versions of Robin or four or five versions of Robin. They just know Robin the Boy Wonder. So they're thinking you know Burt Ward and Adam West, and now you know Robin is uh, is into guys. So, but at the end of the day, it's just lazy writing. Uh, it's like. It's like when they used to kill characters to get interest in them, and that was the only idea they had for a long time. Uh, now they they uh, they delve into the character's sexual proclivities. And for my money, and when I was writing comics, and I was writing under the comic code, my, none of my characters were ever sexually active. Now, I wrote plenty of scenes where, you know, there was a clinch and a fade out, and you could assume that the characters went on to, uh, you know, do the do the deed but but i left that up to the reader you could you could believe that or you could not i it was like the old movies where the lead leading man and the leading lady you know have a passionate kiss fades to black and when we see them again they're you know having breakfast together wearing different clothes so you could think you know you could fill in the blank between those two scenes any way you wished and that's why i always left it uh, the only characters I ever had who were sexually active that I wrote were Conan the Barbarian and uh, occasionally Frank Castle would get lucky. But other than that, I didn't. You know, I dealt in romantic relationships rather than sexual ones. But by introducing the idea that that a character is, is gay or bisexual, you, you are introducing the sexual aspects of it. I mean, you're... you're saying the word you know you're and i just don't think it has a place i know most i know kids don't really read these things anymore and they're written for adults but it just seems like a weird way to go uh to in, in a medium filled with characters who run around in masks and capes and boots um it just seems to approach the fetishistic to explore their sexuality in any way even just to hint at it, uh, which I which I imagine that's what this comic is doing. It's simply hinting at what might happen uh, in between the panels or in between issues. So I don't see any point to it. So like I said, you know, no, I'm not disgusted. I'm not angry. I mean, he's, I don't know these characters. They can do what they want with them. Uh, but it is just, it's boring at the end of the day. It's just boring. Uh, and, and a little disappointing. So, hey, I got a new novel out. It's Levon's Hunt. It is the ninth novel in the Levon Cade series. And uh, this is the novel series that scratches my Punisher itch. Levon Cade is a badass former Marine, Alabama boy, 
who uh, in this novel gets himself in trouble with a ring of, um, of child sex traffickers that uh, goes all the way up to a United States congressman. So Levon is getting himself deep into trouble in this novel, as he has always done in every novel previous. So if you want to check it out, it's an Amazon in paperback and Kindle. And uh, there will be a, another Levon novel before the end of the year called Levon's Prey that's a follow-up to this one. So uh, I'd appreciate it if you took a look. Hey, thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. I, I gird myself for the comments on YouTube following this episode. Uh, and uh, But I appreciate your attention. And I will see all of you down the road.